Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again. Wednesday, midweek Wednesday. Hope everybody's doing well. A um, couple things to talk about. First, I got a uh, a nice comment from a good friend of the show by the name of Nebraska Rancher. First of all, just the name Nebraska Rancher conjures up amazing thoughts, doesn't it? Beautiful Nebraska and uh, being a rancher out there and it's just, I would love to see that ranch. You know, I, I always want to see what Nebraska looks. I love the Midwest. I loved out West, you know, when you come from the city and you get out there, it's, it's a whole new world. Beautiful. Uh, the cities, unfortunately, all the cities make people mentally deranged. <laughs> you notice that? Every big city, it just, it, it, you never cease to see it, no matter what big city it is. New York, Los Angeles, Chicago. Any big, any, once you get above a certain population, people lose their minds. I don't know why that is. Anyway, um, he said that he's pretty heavy, he got deep into the hobby. And I just wanted to address this real quick because he says he bought a lot of, he spent a lot of money on, on all tools, you know, to restore. And I just wanted to put this out there for you uh, people that are just getting into the hobby. This is something we all go through. When you first get into it, you're having such a good time restoring these tools and the satisfaction of seeing the tools restored. What happens is you start going out and kind of bulk buying projects for future, you know, just to have stuff on, on deck so that when you're ready to do another restoration, it's there. But the problem is this stuff builds up quick. And then as you get further on in the hobby, a lot of times you might not want to go back to those early tools that you started with. So... Uh, just a, a fair warning, because we've all done it. All of us creators here on, on that do tool restorations have buckets of tools we know we're never going to get to. Because, you know, you moved on or some tools are just more trouble than they're worth. Like certain pipe wrenches that don't come apart. And, you know, you do one and you just a crowbar. Another thing, a crowbar. You know, you do one crowbar, it takes you forever. And you just say, man, it's, it's a long time before I'm going to do another one. But you, meanwhile, you have 20 on deck waiting to be done. So certain tools you're not going to get to. I, I must have 50 auto wrenches because I love them so much, but I know I'll never get to them. Just to put that warning out there for you. Um, okay, so for today's first project, uh, you, you all wanted to see the flare gun done. And I was trying to get it done before Halloween because Armando Lani has a uh, little challenge of, uh, uh, you know, doing a tool for Halloween. And um, I was trying to get it done, but I'm a little bit late for that. But I wanted to do it today because uh, for what I do for the Armando challenge is I always try and make a tool with orange and black because I love that color combination. And that's a Halloween color. So uh, let's see what we can do with this flare gun. I got some high hopes. Okay, so here's the flare gun in question. I picked it up at the Long Island Tool Meet uh, last week, and you could see here the condition it's in. It's it's a little rough aware, but these, remember, were on a boat many times. The salt, you know, the salt air gets to them. They get corroded a little bit here. This one was painted white, but the white paint is chipping off, but it's a cast material, so it doesn't really rust, except the hammer's a little rusty and the trigger. So we're going to see what we can do with this and make it nice. I love this little gun. Okay, here we are a couple hours in. You see, we uh, took all the paint off with the wire brush and also paint remover. Uh, we cleaned up all the metal that took all the rust off. Uh, we leave in the white here in the, the grip, underneath the grips. No reason to take that off. The grips will cover that. And uh, took all the paint out of the barrel and everything. Now, my plans is to paint this because it won't accept bluing. So I'm going to try and paint this a nice color combination using black and orange. And we'll be back when the paint is dry okay next up real quick you know i uh i put out a challenge to make a short handle ball peen a while back and a lot of you guys did it and love it and you should because it's a fantastic hammer um a larger head like this one here you can see i have it on the scale here and this one here comes in at 28 ounces now that's the handle and the head uh so that's a pretty substantial head size right and uh, that's that short handle. It's just perfect. I use it all the time. Uh, next up, a one I use has a little bit longer handle. And you can see here, this one comes at 17 ounces. Again, with that uh, handle on there. I use this quite a bit. But um, I've been using this little one a lot. And uh, you can see here, this one says 8 ounces. It's a Stanley. Uh, 
look what this comes in. It comes in at 11 ounces because you add in a handle, right? But what I wanted to point out is that the smaller the head, the longer the handle. Because, uh, you know, choking, you don't usually choke up on a very small hammer. You, you know, you choke up on a larger hammer. But when you have a longer handle on a, uh, a smaller head, you can get a little bit more uh, head speed, you know, and leverage when you're using it down here. And, you know, tap it out or whatever you have to. You might choke up a little bit, but you don't want to have a short, a very small head with a short handle because... You know, uh, unless you're putting tacks or something in. But if you have a larger head that you're not using, cut the handle down. I guarantee you'll use it 10 times more. So just a little food for thought. There. Okay, next up real quick. I wanted to do these number five master locks. They're quite large. They're beautiful lock. Well made. And uh, these are vintage. I want to show you some differences, especially these don't have the original keys. But uh, let's clean them up real quick and show you. It's so easy. Wire brush, fiber wheel. We'll be back. Well, this project done you know i have such a passion for uh old locks i just ever since i'm a kid i just love the whole mechanical nature of them and these clean up so nicely what's so nice about the vintage locks they didn't have the blue bumper guard now that's a bumper guard so don't scratch up anything that's what that nylon uh, plastic guard is that they have on the newer locks but you know what the problem is that shows the age they get scratched up there's nothing you could do with them Whereas when you have a vintage one like this, this thing looks, you can't tell that this isn't new old stock. I mean, look at that. It's absolutely beautiful. And it works like the day it was, the day it was made. Look at this. Look how this thing works. Listen to it. Hear it? This thing, and listen to it close. It's just, the action on these are just absolutely beautiful. I've never had a lock fail on me, a master lock. Never. And as you know, Forget about picking them. Guys talk about picking. Nobody picks a lock. They all cut into it, especially now with the, the portable grinders and stuff. But this is a heavy-duty lock. Still good today. And um, the difference between these two, let me show you this one here. Uh, this one here is a little bit different because uh, if you notice on top here, this one says patented. See that? Patented, made in the USA. This one here says patented master, made in the USA. So it's a little different. Same lock on the bottom. They use the uh, same type. Now, uh, if you look over here, you see this little number. That's the key code. Okay, so what they would do, a locksmith has a special book that he could make a key from this number. You don't have to have a key. So what you're supposed to do when you get these locks is grind that number off so a thief can't have a key made. But you can see here, this one has the key, the identical number on here. And uh, just beautiful locks, master. Now what I do is I take a piece of length of string, I tie the two keys and I leave it hanging on there and uh, then I put it upstairs in the collection. But such fun, so much fun, these locks. Okay, next up, I have to film this in some widescreen, which I don't usually do because this box is very big. It's 15 inches long by 11 inches wide. And what this is, Brian O'Hare dropped this off with the, uh, with the knife and the ax we're gonna be doing this week. And uh, this is a game called Tip It. And uh, it's probably one of the most popular games you've never heard of. Uh, it was invented about 1965, and uh, it's still made today in a different variation, but very similar. And what it was was a game of balance and dexterity. And you could see back in the day, and here's one thing I want to point out real quick. Let's take a look, if we can, at this box art, this beautiful box art. And here we have a typical family of years ago, which they're trying to get away from now. They don't want... <laughs> they don't want the typical family, but here it is. You would look at this as a kid and say, wow, look at the dad, the two boys and the girl. Well groomed, right? Nice haircuts, all of them, well dressed. And now, as it's funny, because as this game progressed, so did the box art. And you could see here and back in 1980, it changed a little bit. You could see that the the uh, the hairstyles a little bit longer. The college shirts are starting to go, and now the latest rendition. They put some kind of crazy graphics on the box, uh, I guess, to try and be more inclusive, or whatever. But the funny thing is, I thought of how nicely these these kids were dressed, and and the father, like I said, all clean cut. Whether or not it was uh, it was true to depiction or whatever, but it was always something to look at. So here it is. What it is, like I said, a game of balance and. Uh, Here's what the box looked like when you opened it up. 
you have, and here's the instructions on the inside here, which was always nice. And uh, let me show you how this worked. We'll set this up and I'll show you how this so here's works. the game set up. You see the man up here balanced on a long pole. It's balanced on a secondary uh, uh, tripod, so to speak, and it uh, has a base down here. And how this works, you have this little fork, and uh, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to remove the disc only using the fork. You spin the little spinner and, until it gives you a, uh, a, a color. So when you give it like that, one would say blue. So now I would have to remove the blue disc and I would have to take this blue disc off without dropping the man. You can see now it's leaning. Okay, it's leaning up, but the man is still there. And you would go around each person. Now, if you uh, should spin the disc and there's like now it's all red. So if you needed a yellow, you would have to take one off, put it over there until you get the balance correct where you can get the yellow. So that was the idea of this game. I just thought... It's so funny that it's still usable after all these years. And you can see here, it does have a bit of a, a topsy-turvy. <laughs> you know, you can, I guess, have a lot of fun if you're playing, especially when it gets down on one side more than the other, and it's really leaning. So I uh, just thought that was interesting, especially since 1965, this game. Still around, and uh, interesting, huh? One other thing I thought was interesting is that years ago, when you went uh, shopping for Christmas gifts or birthday gifts or something, a large box like this was very impressive to bring to a party or put under the tree. Whereas when uh, some of the smaller games, you know, like Uno or a card game is, came in. So they always package the, the game and toy makers knew to package it as big as they could without costing them a lot of money. And uh, this way it just seemed like a better gift, you know. Who, what would you rather, as a kid, you would rather have a gift this size than a gift this size, right? Another interesting point. Okay, the paint is dry. Now, you know my favorite part. Remember what this flare gun looked like before we started? And we're calling this project done. I apologize about the fingerprints. I've been playing with this thing for a while. Lubed it all up. Let me show you what we did. First of all, can we take a moment to appreciate that little orange inlay in there? Doesn't that look nice? And again, the black and orange motif for, for the Halloween challenge. Looks real nice. Lub everything is lubricated, cleaned. Uh, you can see how it operates. You know, I left all the parts that would move um, bare metal and then lubricated, you know, but uh, everything else is painted black because uh, it is a casting. I tried bluing it. This will not accept blue, but I do have that contrast of, of uh, silver, orange, and black. I just love it. Love the rail, the sight rail, uh, silver. You can see the hammer silver, the pin here, the pivot pin, the front. Uh, clean the barrel out. The barrel is uh, uh, without paint now. And uh, I would really like a nice lanyard on this. One other thing is the grips. Because they're plastic, they kept getting this white fog. You know, very similar to all plastics. It fogs up. And no matter how many times I cleaned it. So what I did to get around that is I, I cleaned it with denatured alcohol and then shellacked it. So that's a coat of shellac on there. And it got rid of, all, you know, it's presentable again. So what do you think? You like the color combination? And... Uh, I just love it. Nice little gun. Works the way it should. Nice and smooth. Yeah, flare gun. Now, one thing to remember, this is 25 millimeter flares they use, okay? Um, now, that 25 millimeter is a little bit bigger than a shotgun uh, uh, cartridge. Shotgun cartridge would be considered about 18.5 millimeter. So you can see that uh, this is quite a bit larger, so you can't make the mistake of putting one of them in here. You know, thinking back, it's funny how some games and uh, toys that we received when we were younger had a very short lifespan. You know, you would play it, you know, 15 minutes later, we'd go back in the closet. You wouldn't play and then you'd pull it out again when you were bored. And 15 minutes later, we'd go back, you know, the games of Monopoly and Parcheesi and Yahtzee and all those games. They would sit in the closet and then every once in a while, you'd be so bored that you'd pull them out and you'd have a little fun for a while and... You know, eventually, sometimes it would lead to an argument or a fight because somebody was <laughs> trying to cheat. <laughs> yep, the old days of games. We don't see too much of that anymore since the advent of the computer, but they were big time years ago. They were for, for they had a good run. Uh, almost 100 years people were playing games and toys. But, you know, it's slacking off now. I can see why. Anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. Special thanks to Brian O'Hare for uh, bringing that over, and uh, I hope you have a great day. We'll see you again on Friday. Take care now. Bye-bye. <laughs>
any big, any, once you get above a certain population, people lose their minds. I don't know why that is.